Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining. My name is Yulia Shinderovich, and I work as a senior lecturer at the Wolfson Center for Young People's Mental Health. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to this lecture, which is our last lecture for this academic year. Uh, and today's lecture is hosted by the Wolfson Center and also supported by the recently established Cardiff University Global Health Network. So welcome back and a special welcome to everyone joining for the first time. Uh, if it's your first time, this is a public lecture series which is being recorded and the recording will be posted on YouTube. We'll share the link to the center's YouTube channel in the chat uh, and you'll be able to see there as well any previous talks from the series that you may have missed. This session is scheduled for an hour and questions and discussion are very much encouraged. So please do post your questions via the Q&A box, uh, which you should be able to see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And you're welcome to post questions at any time during the lecture. We'll come to them in the second half of the hour. So I'm delighted to introduce our speaker for today, Professor Vikram Patel. Professor Patel is the Paul Farmer Professor and Chair of the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Professor Patel also leads the Mental Health for All Lab at Harvard. He is also a co-founder of the Center for Global Mental Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and a co-founder of Sangath, an Indian NGO focusing on mental health. Today, Professor Patel will talk about school interventions for promoting adolescent mental health and focus on a case study of a whole school intervention developed and evaluated in India. Over to you, Vikram. Thank you so much. I think we just need you to unmute yourself. Thank you so much, Julia. You think after so many years of being Zooming, you remember, I'd remember to unmute myself. I was just saying thank you for inviting me um, and really happy to be connected with your community. Uh, I'm going to spend the next half an hour um, really presenting a case study of a work really which uh, originates to my earliest thinking about what matters for young people's mental health going back to the late 90s, but culminating in a large randomized control trial, uh, which I will describe in a little bit more detail. Um, I just want to start by just reminding us something that all of us are familiar with, really, is that our interest or concerns about adolescence and young adulthood um, in terms of the life course uh, 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 burden of mental health problems is really because most mental health problems begin uh, before the age of 25. In fact, uh, the onset of uh, the first mental disorders occurs before the age of 14 in fully one third of all individuals who will later on go on to develop a diagnosable mental health condition in later life at about half before the age of 18. So clearly this, this is a very sensitive developmental phase of life for the emergence of mental health problems. And for any program that is seeking to prevent mental health problems across the life course, working at, with this age group is going to be of paramount importance. Uh, this particular epidemiological finding and the notion of working with children and young people has really been embraced by virtually all scientific communities. Uh, here I'm just giving you three examples of um, uh, scientific products that I was involved with. Uh, the World Bank's Disease Control Priorities Program, the Lancet Commission on Mental Health and Sustainable Development, and the Lancet Commission on Adolescent Health, all of which have really emphasized the importance of uh, prevention for mental health problems beginning in childhood and especially uh, during adolescence. And of course, uh, not surprisingly then, that schools are really highlighted as perhaps the single most important platform for the delivery of such preventative interventions. For obvious reasons, um, adolescents around the world will spend significant periods of their lives in schools. Somebody once did a calculation that of the wakeful hours uh, in an adolescent's life, two thirds will in fact be spent with peers uh, in either school or out of school environments. And of course, peer relationships are profoundly important in shaping uh, adolescent behavior, adolescent mental health. Uh, and I'll turn to that a little later. 
the factors uh, uh, related to being in school can adversely impact mental health. An obvious example would be bullying and violence experienced in school settings. Uh, and of course, schools, because they really have um, their controlled environments in many ways where adolescents will spend uh, not only significant periods of their time, but also significant periods of their time in which they are working uh, in a group format with a very strong uh, um, disciplinary environment, for example, having to be in class for certain periods of time, as well as a real mixed uh, range of activities that uh, schools offer uh, uh, adolescents, uh, you know, combining both education with peer interaction, with recreation, with sport, and so on and so forth. So switching now to the kind of approaches that people have traditionally taken uh, to try and optimize on this opportunity, uh, and therefore by designing interventions that can help prevent mental health problems, one approach has really been to take psychological treatments that have been shown to be effective in the treatment of mental health problems like mood and anxiety conditions, and then, as it were, adapt these for a much more universal preventative strategy. So you can imagine taking a treatment and uh, maybe diluting uh, uh, you know, the dose of the treatment by having it uh, uh, delivered in a non-clinical way, but essentially capturing the same mechanisms uh, as the treatment. And, and there have been some significant trials that have been conducted in the last decade which have attempted to test this approach uh, uh, and ask the question, do these uh, lead to a reduction in the onset of mental health problems uh, in, uh, in a universal school-based approach? So here are three uh, examples of large recent trials. Of course, I'm sure all of you are familiar with Myriad, which was conducted in England, uh, which used mindfulness exercises, mindfulness being an evidence-based treatment for uh, uh, um, tre you know, relapsing forms of depression. Uh, you had the Climate Schools Combined uh, program in Australia, which was based on CBT, whereas mindfulness was, was delivered by teachers. Uh, in Climate School Combined, the digital program was, of course, uh, self-delivered. Um, and then you had a large school mental health trial in Chile, um, which was classroom sessions, again, based on CBT delivered by non-specialist providers. Now, unfortunately, all three were null trials. Uh, and it's it's kind of led to a sense of um, somewhat despondency that, uh, uh, you know, interventions that are designed on the basis of effective psychological treatments, certainly when delivered in this form uh, as a universal intervention, seem not really to be producing population level changes in the burden of mental health problems. So I want to now switch to a, a very different approach, and this is the approach that I have followed for more than two decades, uh, culminating in this particular trial. And this is not uh, about teaching young people a variety of different cognitive behavioral skills, but actually promoting the agency of young people to be active partners in modifying uh, the social environment of their schools, the term school climate is frequently used to reflect really this, this construct uh, of the social environment, but uh, it really refers to how young people experience the social environment in schools and it focuses very much uh, not on their internal psychological uh, environment, but very much more on peer environments, the relationships that young people have uh, with, uh, uh, with their teachers, and of course the physical environment uh, of the schools uh, uh, that, uh, that they are uh, spending so much time in. So Sahar was a program really that, that was a kind of a fruition of nearly 15 to 20 years of pilot work, of iterative development work uh, that I led in India. Uh, and, and, and so this, this program uh, uh, was then, uh, you know, reached the point of kind of, a, as it were, a ripe stage for us to be testing this, uh, this uh, intervention in a, um, in a randomized control trial. We chose actually one of India's most impoverished uh, regions uh, uh, to test this trial. Uh, this was in the district of Nalanda in Bihar. Bihar is India's poorest state. Um, and we, ra we ran the trial in quite easily the most uh, low resource schools that I have ever worked in in my life. These were government run secondary schools uh, in, this, uh, in this district. Uh, fully 80% of the young people in those schools uh, were the first in their family to go to secondary school. And almost the entire population of students, their parents were farmers, uh, uh, most of whom were essentially laborers on other people's farms. 
so this really represents perhaps the most uh, under-resourced uh, environment with the most uh, marginalized group of young people uh, that I personally have ever had to work with. The program was de designed by Sangha, the NGO that I co-founded um, and with whom I have worked for the last 30 years uh, and was delivered in partnership with the Directorate of Education of the government of Bihar. Uh, uh, of course, this was a very important partner because these schools were all run by that directorate. Over a couple of years, in very close uh, partnership with adolescents themselves, but also with teachers, uh, we really designed a, uh, the theoretical framework uh, of uh, how this intervention was intended to modify school climate, and then how uh, the school climate change would then ultimately read, uh, lead to the health outcomes that uh, we were interested in. Uh, 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 to examine. And so you can see that the strategy is really focused on whole school peer groups and individual counseling, but the individual counseling was very much targeted uh, uh, to those young people who needed it. It was not universal. Uh, yeah, you can see a variety of mediators that we uh, that we uh, uh, identified that would then lead to the intermediate outcome of which school climate was the most important intermediate outcome, and then those would lead to a range of uh, uh, of health related outcomes. Today, I'm going to really focus primarily on presenting to you the um, uh, the results of the school climate as well as the uh, uh, on depression and bullying and violence. Uh, we've actually not only uh, described all the other outcomes, but also importantly, we've also done a mediation analysis that examines which of these various uh, uh, mediators uh, uh, influence the ultimate results. In a co-production format, we then design, uh, we then arrived at a series of different activities uh, that would uh, uh, would allow us to actually uh, implement this intervention. You can see some of these here, and you'll also see a short video in a moment that describes these activities on the ground. Uh, and so I will I will then move to that video uh, in a moment. And finally, it was really important for us to acknowledge also that mental health could not be seen as being separate from a range of other concerns of young people, and in fact. We, we, we arrive at this over decades of work that the very notion of dealing with mental health separately itself was a uh, was a, a, a question that was rejected by many young people. They really saw mental health as being deeply interwoven with many other issues, such as, for example, their sexual well-being, um, with uh, the question of uh, the educational and academic pressures they had, uh, and of course, gender uh, and violence. So this is particularly important uh, in this uh, the, the, this particular context where uh, you know patriarchy is extremely dominant. Now. We really wanted to test the intervention, but we realized that the best way that all I experienced with the intervention had so far been uh, working with counselors that we uh, programmatically recruited. But the Department of Education said that that's that's not a good idea because, you know, we really want to see how this intervention can work in the hands of teachers. We had many good reasons to fear the idea of having teachers deliver the intervention, but we had to, of course, in, in, in the spirit of partnership, say, OK, well, you know, we should test the intervention being delivered by teachers as well. And thus, uh, this intervention was delivered in two separate arms. In one arm, the same intervention was delivered by a counselor who was really a young adult from the neighborhood uh, of those schools. Uh, who was trained by uh, Sangat. And in another arm, it was delivered by a teacher appointed by the school principal and who underwent exactly the same training, but obviously in a separate group uh, comprising all the teachers uh, uh, who had been identified for uh, the schools in the teacher arm. And I'll, I'll speak more about those arms in a moment. So we, we uh, uh, worked with 75 schools, um, uh, uh, about 25 in each arm. So you can see here, we had 25 schools in which we had the Seher counselor, that is the external counselor, uh, 25 schools in the teacher, uh, uh, as a Seher counselor, and 25 schools, uh, which were the comparison arm. Now you'll see the letters AEP. AEP is the Adolescent Education Program. This is a life skills training program. The, this is a very well-established uh, curricular uh, 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 intervention in which a range of life skills that have been designed by UNICEF uh, are, are, are taught to the students um, in a curricular format in the classroom. The life skills can include things like, for example, uh, uh, covering sexuality, uh, covering, uh, uh, you know, managing one's uh, mood. So there are definitely mental health life skills as well, but they're really taught in a very didactic uh, 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 curricular uh, framework. Uh, the trial involved 75 schools, um, and there were cross-sectional surveys, so this was not a panel study. The entire sample of students present in the school 
uh, at baseline, at a uh, eight month follow up, and at seventeen month follow up, were eligible to participate in uh, in these in these cross section surveys. Um, and and you know what you see the growth in the numbers here really also reflects uh, the growth in the numbers of students enrolling in these schools. And so what you can see here is. Um, that at the baseline we had nearly 13,000, we had just over 13,000 students at eight months, uh, that number swelled to 14,000 students. This reflects the fact that at the start of the academic year, there are fewer students who show up in class. At the end of the academic year, which is eight months after enrollment, uh, the number grows because a lot of students sort of join in incremental ways across the year. And two years after the baseline, uh, the numbers swell, uh, swell even more. Uh, and you can see here, it is now 15,000 students. And it really reflects, again, as I said, uh, the secular pattern of the increasing numbers of students joining school, sometimes from other schools as well, into the secondary school uh, uh, period. I'm not going to be presenting very much about the qualitative evaluation, other than just, just to explain some of the findings that we had from the quantitative results. Uh, here's a short video uh, that really shows how the intervention was delivered.
sorry, something happened to that video, but I'm going to continue. I think you, you, you would have got a sense there about the importance of really promoting agency as a very central, perhaps if a slightly abstract uh, uh, idea on how one can actually modify the social environment of schools. So here are the, the headline results. Uh, the seven, eight month, that is to say the primary endpoint results were published in The Lancet in 2018. And then a two year uh, 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 follow up was, in, uh, was published in PLOS Medicine. The intervention continued for the full two years. So in a way, you can also see this as a dose response uh, 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 um, uh, analysis when you compare what happens over uh, the at the eight month period with a 12 month period. So you can see also, I'm going to show you a series of slides, so please do orient yourself here. The blue line is the control arm. The red line is going to be the line of the intervention uh, clusters uh, where uh, the intervention was delivered by a counselor. And the black line is where the same intervention was delivered by teachers. So if we look at a school climate, which is uh, rated on a self-report uh, questionnaire, um, uh, the, uh, there was virtually no change um, and in school climate ratings in the 25 schools in the control arm. If you look at uh, the Seher Mitra arm, uh, which is to say the counselor delivered intervention, you can see uh, the, uh, the, the same starting point in those 25 schools, but a significant improvement in school climate. Uh, a higher score is a better score. But if you look at the teacher, it looks exactly the same as the control arm. Let's look at what we found for depressive symptoms measured with the PHQ-9. These are mean PHQ-9 scores uh, at each of the three time points. In the control arm, you would saw no difference at all. In fact, a slight elevation uh, as the um, uh, as the, uh, 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 the the uh, over the two year uh, period of follow up. If you see the um, uh, a teacher, uh, the the uh, um, counselor delivered arm, you'll see a dramatic reduction in the prevalence of, uh, uh, or rather the mean PHQ-9 scores. And if you converted that into prevalence of mood and anxiety problems uh, using a threshold cut point, you would also see really large reductions uh, in uh, case level uh, morbidity. And then if you look at the teacher delivered intervention, uh, again, no difference from the control arm. So it's important to see here, it's the same intervention, but it's being delivered by two different kinds of providers in the hands of the lay counselor, really large reductions in uh, uh, depressive symptoms, uh, but in the hands of the teacher, no difference at all. Plus another important point to say is you see a dose response effect as well. You see this also in, uh, in the, uh, if a school climate that between eight months and 12 months, the effects increase and you see that again for depression as well. Let's look at uh, bullying. Uh, this is a frequency of uh, uh, the experience of bullying. Uh, if you see uh, the control arm, no change over time, in fact, a slight worsening. You see the uh, uh, the counselor arm, dramatic reductions, and again, a dose response relationship. And if you see the teacher arm, in fact, probably does the worst of all. And then self-reported perpetration of violence uh, in the control arm, you'll see uh, a worsening over time. Uh, with the counselor arm, a dose response improvement. And in the teacher arm, again, almost uh, a, a parallel to the control arm. So in a nutshell, what we found was that a teacher delivered whole school intervention that targeted social environment produced uh, large benefits, but not when delivered by uh, the teacher. Uh, the barriers to the intervention that we, we identified through the qualitative studies, which were conducted actually before we unblinded the trials, so in a way these were not influenced by the quantitative results, uh, was really the most important reason why the teacher did not seem to succeed was really because teachers were very overburdened. Because students really could not uh, uh, accept the teachers suddenly switching their roles from what was very hierarchical, didactic, to suddenly becoming a collaborative uh, 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 you know, person who wanted to address school issues, which sometimes actually included issues to do with the teaching staff. So they really didn't settle in and, and trusted uh, the teacher as, um, uh, as someone who was the right person. They could talk about the issues that they wanted changed. Uh, and of course, there were a variety of other concerns about confidentiality of students telling teachers things that could potentially in their minds be leaked 
uh, to the uh, to, to for example the head teacher or, or or other teachers that might land them in trouble. And of course, for teachers themselves who were selected, um, they they were really disempowered. They were really appointed uh, uh, by principals, and that reflects very much the hierarchical structure with which these schools actually work. Um, and there were really no incentives to deliver the intervention. The facilitators of the intervention that really largely was seen in the uh, uh, in the in the counselor arm was the support of the school principal, uh, the active engagement of teaching staff as well as other school staff members, such as, for example, the cleaning staff. Um, the very active engagement of students. And, you know, the, the, it wasn't just engagement of students, but really uh, respecting what students um, had identified as issues that they wanted to address and supporting them in, in, in being able to implement the changes that were needed in the school, um, creating robust platforms and mutual trust uh, uh, for students and teachers to exchange concerns that they had uh, about one another and how those could be addressed in a consensual way. And very importantly, a functioning school health promotion committee that included uh, representation of teachers, of parents, uh, and of students, which were, this, this committee was really charged with um, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, monitoring the progress uh, of the of the program. Uh, you know, identifying issues that needed uh, uh, to be uh, uh, you know fine tuned, um, but essentially really acted as a monitoring and evaluation committee uh, for the program. I want to end by uh, just describing a little bit about the individual counseling component. I believe Daniel Mitchelson, who uh, worked with me uh, in, 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 in our PRIDE program in Sangat for many years, has already presented this in more detail. Um, but I wanted to just I, I, I say that we did use a CBT-based approach, but not as a whole school intervention, but only for those young people who sought help from the counselors uh, when... Um, uh, and this was a really interesting finding, actually, that in the... In the, in the um, arm which the counselors were running the intervention, 5% of the student body actually sought individual help, which is really quite remarkable. Um, it really indicated that, uh, that young people in those schools uh, were really far more aware of their mental health. And oftentimes what you see in, with counselors in, 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 in schools is that young people really don't want to uh, access the counselor because of the stigma uh, attached to seeing the counselor. But it was exactly the opposite in these schools where we found 5% uh, 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 of the entire student body actually seeking help. Um, the counseling was really brief, uh, just three to four sessions based on uh, uh, you know, a problem solving uh, structure. You can see some of the booklets that we designed uh, to deliver uh, the problem solving. Uh, in a separate study, we had already evaluated this counseling intervention in low-income schools in which we examined how problem solving delivered by a counselor compared uh, with a active control arm uh, where uh, 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 all the counselor, the problem solving materials were shared with the adolescents uh, in, in this kind of uh, uh, book uh, uh, format, uh, which um, we can fancifully call bibliotherapy. I'm sure Daniel presented uh, these findings with you. Uh, we saw you know, large improvements in both arms really reflecting both, I think, a secular change, uh, but also the fact that uh, practicing these problem-solving skills um, does help. But importantly, we also saw larger effects of the counselor-delivered intervention uh, that was sustained uh, at one year follow-up. Remember, this was just a three to four session intervention. Each session was barely 20 to 30 minutes, so quite brief. Uh, and the counselor was a lay counselor, that is to say, somebody with no prior training uh, in mental health. Uh, and you can see both uh, for the SDQ, which is a symptom, psychological symptom uh, measure, as well as for the youth top problems, which is a self-reported uh, measure of, um, uh, 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 of the perception of the problems that an individual had and how severely stressful they were. You can see that there were uh, uh, significant differences between the counselor delivered arm and the uh, uh, and the uh, uh, bibliotherapy arm. And what's really interesting in the SDQ case is that there's a slight a widening as well of the difference over time, perhaps suggesting that these skills are being practiced uh, more effectively and are ha therefore having more uh, impact uh, on the subgroup of students who have uh, mental health difficulties uh, when they uh, uh, approach the counselor. 
I want to end by just, uh, uh, you know, ex explain to you how I uh, we, we're thinking of school mental health promotion in India right now as a, as a consequence of these multi multiple different studies. We really see the bedrock of school mental health promotion as a whole school, a multi-component health promotion intervention that really uh, seeks to promote, leverage the agency of adolescents uh, uh, to modify the social environments of their schools, and in doing so, also to build healthy peer relationships, which are so central to shaping adolescent mental health. Uh, we also have a classroom intervention that I haven't presented today, uh, which is seeking to improve mental health literacy, which we published in, uh, in the BMJ Global Health, that demonstrated very large increases in the numbers of young people who sought help from a counselor for a low intensity intervention that is based on problem solving. And we also have developed a digital uh, 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 a tool to deliver this intervention and finally, we have uh, for those in, in individuals who really have um, perhaps more severe forms of mental health problems and or do not respond to low intensity brief problem solving, we've also designed a transdiagnostic modular uh, psychological treatment, which can be delivered uh, by mental health professionals, either those who are visiting schools or through referral systems. So this is my last slide. Um, this body of, um, of evidence really for us indicates that, uh, you know, a whole school intervention that targets the social environment delivered by lay counselors. And I want to spend a moment really uh, emphasizing that the delivery agent is actually just as important as the intervention. And that is certainly uh, uh, not only um, the, uh, uh, very evident from uh, the Seher trial, but actually I think also explains why some other a whole school interventions that have been delivered by teachers have not had intended effects. And there are multiple reasons that will vary from one context to the other. But I think it's important to recognize that the delivery agent is just as important to think about as the design of the intervention. Uh, it, that when, when delivered by counselors, we just saw large incremental and sustainable benefits on all the key outcomes. And these findings were consistent for both boys and for girls. Um, and a brief problem solving intervention nested within that whole school intervention would be a very effective first step psychological interventions, but targeted to those individuals who have felt needs, typically self referred felt needs uh, for mental health care. And those self referrals uh, are really uh, themselves driven by the whole school uh, intervention uh, that uh, that engages the agency of young people. So I'll stop there and very glad to take any questions. Vikram, thank you so much. Uh, this is a fascinating presentation and I think very interesting, among other things, to see certain themes emerging across different projects in respect to student agency and whole uh, school change. Uh, uh, I think similar elements to inclusive program in England that showed reductions in bullying, perhaps also the good school toolkit in Uganda with violence reduction. So uh, fascinating. Thank you so much. And it looks like we have a couple of questions already in the Q&A, so please keep those coming. And uh, just a reminder that the settings of the webinar do not allow uh, you to speak directly. So if you do have a question, the best way to ask it is to write it down and put it in the Q&A. Thank you. Yeah. I, I'll just start taking these questions uh, uh, as I see them appearing on the uh, on my uh, Q&A box. Um, so, Sophie, um, you know, uh, the universal school interventions that um, uh, that I cited earlier, some of them have actually seen an unintended increase in mental health symptoms. I, I, I believe the climate school uh, uh, combined intervention um, found uh, and the myriad intervention, both in subgroups, found worsening. Uh, I can't remember the exact pattern, you know, for it was boys or girls or anxiety or depression. Um, but certainly I do recall that in some instances they worsened. And that that is that is a matter of great concern. And one has to really unpack why that might be. It could be a chance finding when you have multiple comparisons and subgroup comparisons. You never know, uh, you know, that you might find things just by chance. But I do think the fact that at least two trials found a worsening in subgroups suggests there's something about teaching young people CBT skills that may not actually always forget about it doing good. It might create a heightened sensitivity uh, uh, about internal phenomena and pathologizing those phenomena uh, uh, as a consequence of their training. 
we did not find any unintended consequences of the whole school intervention. Um, the only thing that I will say is when you look at the main slide results, you'll find we found very little, uh, we found no significant effect on smoking uh, or, or, or sexual health outcomes. And the reason really was that the, the prevalence of rates were very, very low to begin with. This is a relatively young group. We're talking of you know 13 to 15 year olds. And in this particular context, uh, there is an extremely low use of, uh, uh, there's almost no sexually, uh, uh, you know, the primary outcome of sexual um, uh, behavior was sexual intercourse is almost non-existent in this, in this age group, in this uh, context. Uh, and, and, and the other important was unwanted sexual uh, uh, violence, which is reported as part of the bullying uh, outcome. Um, Kripa, um, thanks so much for your question. Yeah, I don't know the answer why bullying may have gotten worse when teachers deliver the intervention. I just think that's, again, a chance observation. I don't think it has anything specific to do with the teacher delivered intervention. Uh, I think it's just the fact that bullying got worse in both control and uh, a teacher delivered uh, uh, arms. Uh, I just think that just shows that bullying was getting worse in uh, over time. Uh, whereas at the same moment uh, in the uh, arm in which the counselors were delivering the intervention, uh, bullying actually uh, declined. And, and so the effects were even larger when you compared with the other schools. Um, so the lay counselor is not a student. The lay counselor, you know, so that's an interesting question because oftentimes, you know, one approach has been to use peers, that is to say students in the school. We did a lot of co-production work and, uh, and found that this would not work in these schools for two very important reasons. First of all, those peers were themselves members of the student community. Uh, and so in many ways, they were sharing the same issues of social environment as all the others. And secondly, there's a question of how do you appoint somebody in the, in the school who would be respected and accepted by everybody else? Um, so we finally settled on somebody from outside the school, but who in most instances had actually gone to that same school. So they were local uh, young people who were unemployed. They had gone to the same school, so they understood the school environment. And in terms of age, were not exactly the same age as the adolescents, but they were closer in age to them uh, than the teachers were. So they came kind of like almost like a peer in the sense they were from the same school. They were you know young adults, but they were not actually uh, a, a, another student. So it really was from the community, but had a strong link with that particular school in which they were placed. Uh, so, you know, I, the implementation mechanism, you know, honestly, I think the main reason was that um, students trusted uh, the counselor more than they trusted the teacher. And therefore, they engaged with the intervention in a much more meaningful way than simply uh, the process indicators, which the, the process indicators would show the number of activities were very similar in the two arms. But there's something we cannot measure through quantitative process indicators, which is really the level of trust, the level of, a, uh, you know, a genuine um, belief that uh, that what the young people were saying was being heard, what the young people wanted to happen was likely to happen. Uh, and I think, in fact, when we looked empirically at how much change happened in the so social environment of the schools, as reflected in the school climate uh, 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 measures, you see that, in fact, there was really no impact on school climate at all. So I think that's a key uh, a mechanism. I have to say also teachers themselves in these schools are terribly overburdened. And uh, and they, 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 you know, just to give you an idea, there were some schools with more than 2000 students and there were just 10 teachers in those schools. Uh, and so many teachers were, were teaching multiple years, multiple subjects. Um, you know, many teachers would be, uh, you know, on leave for sick, sickness reasons. And, you know, so that number would shrink and you had to fill in classes, et cetera. Um, and also, it's a very hierarchical, uh, you know, setting where teachers had very little agency themselves. So I, I, I do think that, you know, this is not a, um, a reflection that teachers are not good at what they do, but also of the of the reality of the of the working conditions um, that uh, uh, many teachers in this very impoverished uh, setting experience. And finally, also remember that most of these students are themselves first generation learners. Many of them have learning difficulties. Many of them. Uh, really, there's no parental involvement in the schools. Uh, you know, we would have these parent uh, uh, meetings, you know, maybe 10 percent of the kids' parents would turn up. Um, you know, so it, it's it's a really, really perhaps very difficult environment, one that maybe one wouldn't really see in urban India or, or indeed wouldn't even see, you know, certainly wouldn't see perhaps where, where uh, you know, um, in Wales, for example, or in England. Uh, Camille, uh, Samil, um, I don't know if I pronounced your name correctly. I'm sorry if I haven't. Um, 
Um, Samil, your question is, um, can you speak to youth suicidality within the uh, priority research areas for? So, you know, um, it's interesting. This is, uh, this is not an age group um, in which we saw a lot of youth uh, suicidality. We saw some self-harm, but not um, suicidality. Su suicidality, in my experience, tends to be more common in slightly older adolescents and in, in young adults. Um, we actually have data on suicidality in the trial, uh, which again, you can find in the main trial papers, and you'll see the prevalence is very low. But on the other hand, in slightly older adolescents, like the 16 plus age group, you're absolutely right to point out that self-harm and suicidality are both very common and risk assessment is extremely important. Ideally, this can only be done through mental health literacy programs where people you know, are made aware uh, about um, you know, what they can do when they have thoughts such as this, uh, such as self-harm thoughts. And of course, in the problem-solving intervention, um, there is a systematic risk assessment uh, apart for the counselor to actually conduct and where there is, um, you know, a risk identified, the counselor will then consult their supervisor, uh, oftentimes during the session, uh, to get a consult. Um, the supervisor would assess the young person and make a decision or, or recommendation on what should be done. Uh, Harshal, you're at Swansea. That's wonderful. Um, I remember Swansea well. I'd come there for a Marseille. Uh, a conference uh, some years ago. Um, suicide attempt was an exploratory outcome. Yeah. So I think it's 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 uh, it, it, it's the effect is small, if not in fact is non-existent. Is partly because of statistical power. First of all, uh, you know, um, if it's a, it's if something is very rare. Uh, you're unlikely to find any effect on uh, on that uh, outcome. Uh, and secondly, I, the intervention was not specifically targeting suicide. Um, it was targeting mental health in a broad, positive way. Uh, that's the other important point I wanted to actually emphasize is that what, what mental health how mental health was addressed in this intervention was not through a biomedical disease focused, uh, 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 you know, um, approach like we weren't really talking about depression and anxiety, but it was really much more through a positive psychology approach. You know, it was much more about self-efficacy, about managing your 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 moods in a more uh, effective way rather than them getting on top of you, et cetera. So it was very much more a positive mental health uh, 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 approach rather than a negative one. I, we, we, again, we took a very strategic decision not to talk about suicide because that felt like it would immediately create a sense that this whole program was about something really dark and 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 and, and you know what was associated with you know stigma, etc. But also because the practical reason that actually, you know, suicide uh, 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 behavior was extremely rare uh, in this population. You know, remember, we're talking of 13 to 15 year olds. And, and if you look at the suicide data in India, suicide really is a problem of older uh, adolescents and especially young adults. You know, that's the 18 plus age group. Um, thank you, Sweta. Uh, Curious about the nature of the schools, um, public government. Right, you know, this was all uh, government schools. Uh, you know, these were all, there were no, pri there were some private schools in this area, it has to be said, but uh, these were all government schools. Uh, the government was very um, supportive of the project. They were not happy with the result. Um, they were not happy with the result because they really wanted teachers to succeed, so they didn't have to pay any more money. Uh, you know, because a, a counselor effectively meant they had to invest in a new provider. Now, things have changed in different parts of India. That, you know, education is a state issue. India is a federal uh, country. And so education is entirely a state government issue. The good news is that in some states of India, including Goa, where all our preliminary work was done, uh, the state government have actually created a cadre of counselors. Uh, and so, uh, you know, in New Delhi, another state where we work with very closely, also the state government has created a cadre of counselors. So I do believe that over time we will see counselors in most government schools. And therefore, this intervention uh, could, in fact, become uh, uh, the intervention framework for those counselors to use. Right now, the counselors are only giving uh, uh, in most of these states are uh, only giving a traditional uh, psychological treatment for individuals who are referred to them, which, you know, is in all our experience, actually a very narrow perspective of what counselors can and should do. And in fact, 
actually stigmatizes the counselor. Um, you know, it's not uncommon in many of these schools for teachers to tell students who uh, they consider are troublesome that, you know, I'll refer you to the counselor if you don't, uh, if you don't behave. It's almost like a punishment, you know, um, which only adds to stigma. Kids even tease uh, kids who go to the counselor, oh, are you nuts? Are you, have you, you know, are you a mental case, et cetera? So I, I think the whole uh, the whole positioning of a counselor as a mental illness provider is one that actually does disservice to the counselor, and it also does disservice to the young people who are seeking help from that counselor. Um, you know what? I'm not going to try and second guess Bianca. I wish I, I realized when I when I uh, uh, when I mentioned the mediation analysis, I should have just reminded myself. This was a few years ago. We did this. Uh, so it's pu published in the British Journal of Psychiatry. It is led by Daisy Singler. I would recommend that you just look it up, and you'll find um, uh, 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 the results there. Uh, you know, school climate, of course, is a very complex construct, and we broke that down into subcomponents, and um, and you'll see uh, that certain components were very important in predicting or mediating the effect of the intervention on depressive symptoms, uh, and others were not, and and. That really helps us also to understand uh, what it is uh, about this complex multi-part intervention uh, that, um, uh, that, in fact, if I have a moment, if there is some time, I might look up the paper myself and remind you, but there's some more questions that I'll address uh, first. Um, so, um, June, I'd love you to say more about your trial. I'm not familiar with the trial. Of course, these are slightly older age groups. Um, were there extra resources for what? Yes, there were some extra resources, but they came from the school's own fund, not from the project. Um, all schools have a discretionary budget uh, that uh, school principals are allowed uh, some discretion on how they get used. So just to give you one example, you remember in the video, uh, one of the uh, students said, you know, we needed a gym. And, uh, you know, we didn't have a gym in the school. Uh, and so the treadmills and the other gym equipment uh, that were needed, uh, that the stu students asked for, were, were paid for by the, uh, uh, by the uh, school's discretionary budget uh, for improving the school environment. Um, Stephen, <clears throat> yeah, the importance of engaging schools and school leadership. Um, what have you found to be effective? So the most important uh, strategy we found to be effective, I can't say we compared any strategies, so I can't say whether one uh, there were other strategies that could have been more effective, uh, was really the, um, uh, first of all, winning the trust of the school principal by very, very uh, 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 strenuous efforts to engage them at the beginning, creating a kind of a community of school principal peers. So in each arm, the school principals formed a kind of a learning network. Um, we uh, also then engaged the teachers separately in each school by convening meetings uh, uh, of the school um, uh, 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 teaching community. In those, in the arm where we had peer counselors, the peer, uh, the, uh, the counselor, the counselor was in, required to report to the school principal, not to the project. And and was a member of the school community. We made every effort uh, to make them feel like uh, they were a part of the school uh, 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 community of the, of the, not the teacher community specifically, but a member of the overall school community. And of course, the health promotion, uh, 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 the health promotion um, uh, committee that included the principal, teacher representations, and others was a very important uh, mechanism. Uh, for monitoring uh, the quality of the intervention and making everyone feel that they were part of something really exciting and that, you know, changes that were being seen in the school uh, were actually uh, creating a positive feedback loop. And this, of course, was mostly uh, in the council realm because that's where, uh, you know, changes were most visible. Eleanor, is there any best practice guideline? Yeah, I, 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 I won't. Again, we do have guidelines. My, my colleagues in India have done a lot more work on youth co-production. Uh, I think you know the Wellcome Trust is also doing a lot of work on youth co-production. The Wellcome Trust was a major funder of one a component of this work. Um, I, I, I would recommend that you know you, you refer. I would just refer you uh, uh, to those guidelines. And if you'd like me to share the guidelines that Sangat has developed uh, for youth co-production, just email me separately, and I'll introduce you to my colleagues who have produced these guidelines. So, yes, there's a there's a lot of experience that has come from here uh, from this work. And, you know, just to say that youth co-production has to be one of the most important strategies uh, for ensuring that the intervention is acceptable to young people and therefore likely to be more effective uh, when it's delivered. Uh, 
an anonymous attendee. Uh, I am from a low-income archipelago in Asia. How do you handle delivering these interventions? Yeah, well, you know what? One has to take into account uh, varying culture and context. Luckily for us, at least in this context, everyone spoke the same language. You know, um, if you are working with multilingual groups of students, um, you know, I personally have less experience uh, in, in doing that. Um, I mean, certainly the context, uh, the different languages, different contexts, I don't think there is any problem with this intervention being applied in different contexts. But how you would apply uh, in the same context, uh, multiple languages, this I think is a great question. I I personally have no uh, uh, no um, helpful answer to you there because I don't actually have experience. Uh, uh, but H H Julia, uh, Julia is going to be uh, answering that question, I think, in the chat, uh, hopefully. Um, June, we had interventions delivered by mental health support teams who are clinicians. Okay, well, that's that's great. I, I have to say, by the way, I think, you know, as long as I, I, I do say that the outside person could be a mental health clinician. But I do worry sometimes that, you know, when people are identified as mental health clinici clinicians, then again, it it does convey, at least in the Indian context, the uh, the the idea that this is all about disorders and sicknesses. And, and you know, and then that leads to a whole range of other kinds of, uh, uh, you know, uh, implications. That means I might get a medication, uh, you know, or I might have to go see a psychiatrist and I have to go to a hospital, et cetera. So that's just one thing that I found people often make those associations, even if they don't make them explicitly. It's implicitly uh, something that people are, are thinking about. Alka, uh, the Royal College of Physicians has been running a school mental health program uh, across different mediums. Uh, it would be great to share some of this as you plan to say. Yeah, that'd be great, Alka. Do get in touch. I'd love to know. I'd love to maybe share these videos that you describe with my my colleagues in uh, in India. We don't actually work in primary schools, so that would be really great. That would certainly represent an expansion of um, the efforts that we have currently. We're only working in secondary schools. Um, but I agree with you that primary schools are, the, the earlier one begins, the better. In fact, I say that, you know, the best time to actually prevent mental health problems in adulthood is in the first few years of life, because early childhood experiences are perhaps the most profoundly important in shaping uh, 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 brain development and, and mental health. But yes, I'd love to, I'd love for you to share these um, uh, these uh, links with me and and for uh, uh, for me to learn more about the work that you're going to be doing uh, with schools in India in in 2024. Oh, that's this year. So this year, um, Ada, um, could you talk more about the group intervention? Uh, Yes, uh, Ada, just email me. I'll send you the trial paper in BMJ Global Health. It was led by Rachna Parikh, uh, P-A-R-I-K-H. Um, it was a trial that was specifically uh, examining how a classroom-based mental health literacy intervention could increase demand for counseling in the schools. Again, it was co-produced with young people. It was a single period uh, intervention delivered by a lay counselor and involved an animated video with a uh, which really set the stage for a moderated discussion uh, of what the video content was, and you can I, you can see the video as well through a link, a hyperlink in 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 the paper. I'm aware we only have five minutes left, and I wanted to just turn to you, Julia. Uh, there's quite a few questions still coming up. Uh, maybe I'll answer at least one more, uh, and um, and then maybe I'll hand back to you, uh, Mia. Um, the idea of promoting agency is there scope. Well, you know, I guess there is scope for adults, but I think there is a big difference between being 12 years old and being 32 years old in the sense that when you're 32, you already have, in a sense, independence and autonomy in decision making. When you're 12 years old, you're really coming from a, a developmental trajectory where you had virtually no autonomy. Um, and this is especially true in this context where, you know, 12 year olds are really treated as children by their parents and by their teachers. And so promoting agency is, the, is, is also developmentally exactly the right time for you to be, in fact, uh, creating opportunities to promote autonomy and agency, because from a developmental perspective, this is exactly that age in life where this becomes a driver of adolescent uh, uh, behavior. Uh, and so I think there's something very unique from a developmental perspective uh, to promoting agency uh, in a 12, 12, 13 or 14 year old than it is uh, later in life. Okay. 
Julia, should I take any more questions? It's really up to you. If you have the time, I'm right, let me do one. Let we'll me do a couple more. Let's see. We'll keep going to the wire and then I'll stop. Um, so Kripa, we did do process evaluation. There is a publication on that, which uh, uh, I, I know uh, we've never actually gotten around to submitting, uh, but I know we have an advanced draft stage, which again, I'd be happy to share with you. Uh, you know, the most important challenges we observed were entirely to do with teachers. Um, and uh, the good news was that we did this process evaluation, as I mentioned earlier, before we unblinded the trial, so that they were not really, um, you know, influenced by the trial results. So I, I was really happy to see how much the process evaluation you know, uh, actually help uh, explain uh, the rather unexpected results that we had uh, of the trial. The control arm was the government 16-session uh, 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 life education program, life skills education program. This is very widely used in, in many parts of the world. It's a classic UNICEF WHO package of classroom-based education on things like anger management, you know, um, you know, safe touch, uh, you know, uh, yeah, but how to how to how to exercise responsible sexuality, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll take the last question from Bianca. I'm sorry, I can't answer any more. Uh, Bianca, you're from Brazil. Um, yeah, I've been reading about that that disaster. I have friends and colleagues who work in Porto Alegre. Um, I was wondering whether you believe. Uh, you know, it. You know, I don't want to medicalize. You know, a disaster. I think what you really need to focus on for children who have uh, been affected by this disaster is much more a social model of intervention, restarting schools as soon as possible, and creating and normalizing school atmosphere so that you know normalization is in my mind the single most important and and stability of course which is part of normalization is probably the single most important strategy to help children readjust in the aftermath of a very traumatic uh, incident well thank you all very much what a terrific number of questions you guys have asked asked me that's a signal i hope that my 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 talk uh, landed well and that you are all an incredibly engaged audience. Thank you all very much. And thank you, Julia, and to the organizers. For those of you who would like more information, for those of you whose questions I was not able to answer and you'd like to continue the conversation, please email me and I'll do my very best to respond. Professor Patel, thank you so much. We are so grateful for your time. Uh, it's been a wonderful session. Thank you to all the attendees especially everyone who shared their questions. Before you log off, I'd like to encourage you to look in the chat where you'll be able to find uh, the link to the channels to the channel uh, on YouTube where you can watch this recording and other recordings from the series, the center's newsletter. And we've also posted a couple of links uh, to the mediation paper that Professor Patel mentioned uh, and a few other things that might be of interest. Thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you at our upcoming lectures in the next academic year. Thank you, everyone.